Thank you everyone for your time today. Um, we are just rolling right through to our second session um, that's gonna be focused on best practices in board governance. So real hot, juicy topic for us. <laughs> Woo. <laughs> yeah. Um, if you haven't met me, I'm Chelsea Chow and I'm a program officer at Hawaii Community Foundation. And in partnership with the County of Hawaii, we administer the Puna Strong Grant Program. Um, so this is one technical assistance offering for the grantees of that program, but we also wanted to open it to the entire Puna community, um, as there are many other organizations doing wonderful work and uh, probably experiencing similar struggles and have seen questions about all that sexy board stuff. <laughs> so um, I wanted to introduce our presenter, Jennifer Cornish Creed from the Hawaii Alliance of Nonprofit Organizations. She flew in at the crack of dawn this morning to be here with us. And um, yeah, we're so thankful. Um, she will uh, run through some really great, I think, information for you as uh, we look forward to this year. Um, but first we wanted to um, have everyone introduce themselves. Uh, I, I think we have new faces, so even if you introduced yourself in the first session, if you could just quickly say your name and organization, if there's anything specific that you came today wanting to hear about. So we start with you, Lemomi. Hello, my name is Lemomi Sher, and I'm with Volcano Grants, and it was an awesome first presentation, so I'm really looking forward to the next one. Mahalo. Mahalo. Hello, my name is Kehalani. My name is Kaipong Yanin. One of president of Volcano Spread Pretty Friends and learning, 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 learning. Awesome. And I'm Chris Corley. I'm with, um, I'm one of the many advisors of Volcano Friends Pretty Friends. Um, my name is Inglen B. I'm with Volcano Friends Pretty Friends. And this is really good information because I ran a regular business for 16 years. Yeah. So I want to know more about the nonprofit side. Oh, perfect. Excellent. Thank you, Lenny. Okay, maybe Eileen, come to you next. I'm Eileen O'Hara, and I'm with uh, Malama Kopuna. Um, in this context, although I'm on other nonprofit boards. Okay. And, um, it's about making sure that we've established the correct guardrails mm -hmm. for uh, board management. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you, Becky. Becky uh, Jones, as I said in the last session, um, gathering information for a possible new five hundred one c three. Awesome. Thank you. Hi, Misty. Hi. Welcome. Aloha. Hello, I'm Misty Parker, uh, program coordinator for the Disaster Recovery Division, uh, and also for the Shop. Thank you. Glad you're here. Thank you for all your help getting this organized. Gail. Aloha, Coco. Gail Clark. I'm with the Arts and Sciences Center, formed to provide outstanding support and infrastructure for community-based learning rooted in Puna, the home of Haas Public Charter School. Yay. And I've known Hano and Jennifer for many years. Now. Yeah. It's pretty special. I love you. So glad you're here, Gail. Uh, Dave Dubon, Hawaii Tracker. Um, you do a bunch of volcano information stuff online. You're really just trying to get the last few questions answered for our submission and do a high one. Oh, excellent. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you. I'm Gail Dubon. I'm with Bain. <laughs> okay, perfect. Good enough. <laughs> Got it. Hi, Charity. I'm Princess Lloyd of uh, Citizens Polyrect. Great. Thank you. I'm Michael Pipto. I'm the Iron Oil Community Association and also on board with the Digital Alliance. Nice. Thank you. Phil Walker, Iron Oil Community Association, just general knowledge. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wendy Martin, Iron Oil Community Association. Nice. Hello, I'm Kana, and uh, I'm here representing a couple of organizations. Uh, okay. The new one we formed uh, just during the lockdown with lots of Zoom meetings called uh, <laughs> uh, Ohana Ba'ala 
Lima. And it's a mm -hmm. new organization for people with different abilities and different cognitive abilities to be able to take them out on the water so they can experience the ocean. Excellent. Uh, we have our, our 501c3 and we're our, our uh, bylaws, all that kind of stuff right now. Wow, exciting. And I'm also on the leadership board of uh, Yoga Gardens, which is also a nonprofit. Organization. Okay, thank you. I'm on three different organizations. Um, um, it's actually, it's the Gilad Alama Shotgun Congregation Guide of the Gardens, mm -hmm. um, Okuna Rising, the people that are here, mm -hmm. um, and um, Boa Community and Road Association. Excellent. Thank you. Welcome. What's your name? Oh, yeah, Rafa. Everybody knows me. Rafa? <laughs> no, thank you for the connection. <laughs> nice. Rafa, which means blessing in Hebrew. Oh, For wonderful. Some people I are that, some people I are not. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Hi, I'm Patty Pinto. I work for the County of Hawaii Recovery Division, and I'm also the coordinator for the Kilauea Recovery Grant. Wonderful. Thanks, Patty. Claudia? I'm Claudia Zeroli. I serve on several <coughs> nonprofit boards, but I'm here today for our young and growing Puna Makako, uh, which is serving Burn Acres and the Upper Puna community. Mm, thank you. Susie. Charter School. I also sit on the boards of Board Recall at Sunset, A University, Hawaii Track on the Bay, and Naval Life Chamber of Commerce. Wow. <laughs> Susie's busy. <laughs> Welcome. Aloha, I'm Taliesin McEnany. I'm with Hawaii's Volcano Circus down in Sydney. Hi, Taliesin. It was nice to meet you on Zoom. Yeah. I'm Morgan Langham. I'm with Hawaii's Volcano Circus. We're down in Seaview. We host a charter school and uh, community center. Nice. Thank you. Welcome. Barbara. I'm Barbara Archer, and I'm with Marketing uh, neighbors, nonprofit organization trying to build a community center that serves our land as well as the neighboring community. Nice, thank you, Barbara. Amadeo. Um, Amadeo Markoff, I'm with uh, Main Street Pahoa Association, Pahoa Lava Zone Museum, Lower Puna Rising, and I'm here today representing Ma. That's Malama. <laughs> okay, gotcha. You. Gotcha, thank you. Okay. Thank you all for introducing yourselves. Again, some of you, um, but it's nice for us all to know who's who's in the room. Um, so I'm Jennifer, as Chelsea said, and I'm the Director of Professional Development at Hano. And I was saying, we have a small staff of four, so um, we all do a lot of things, but in my area, we're really doing a lot of the training work, the consulting services, we're doing convenings like our annual conference, and then also technical assistance to nonprofits. So um, just a very brief little bit about um, Hano. For some of you, you're familiar with us, but for others, you might not be as familiar. Hano is the state association of nonprofits here in Hawaii. So essentially our mission is to support nonprofits. Whatever your mission is, whatever your size, wherever you are in the state, that's our mission is to support you. And you'll see there that there are some different ways that we do that. Um, including doing some policy work and advocacy at the sector level. So we know all of you are doing really good work on behalf of the folks you work with and for, um, but we're looking at the super sexy stuff like compliance and well, you know, it is, it is kind of sexy, the philanthropy, right? So making sure the environment, the operating environment for nonprofits is healthy. Um, we also do, of course, trainings, workshops, consulting. We have members, we have membership. You can be a member of Hano. I was telling the first group, the most valuable reason to be a member, you will get some things from it, but it's also because that increases our voice as the nonprofit sector. We can be louder the more of us are there together. Um, and of course we do HanoCon every year. Um, this year is the first year we're gonna be going back to in-person Hano conference. So that's gonna be exciting. Um, and then we try to be a, a resource uh, for information and, and um, try to be there to help with any kinds of questions that you might have about being a nonprofit. Eileen. Do you have any idea how many 501c3s there are in the state of Hawaii? Um, I, I don't have a really super accurate current number, but the last time that we looked at data, we were around, 
I feel like it was between five and 7,000, something like that. And those are 501 C's, a, and, and then there's a slightly smaller subset that are C3s. Right. And then of those who are really active C3s, it's an even smaller number. But that's about where we generally are here in, in this state. So, so you, have, you said 300 members in Congo, so you have maybe 10% of Yeah, we really don't, I mean, we. this is a question that came up in the first group was how many members does Hano have? We tend to kind of be around the 300 mark. And what we said was, we're not too worried that we don't have all, you know, 5,000, 7,000 nonprofits. I think we have a lot of the ones that are very active, actually are participants and, and members. Um, but we know that the membership is representative. We have members from all islands, all different missions, um, all different sizes. So. We feel pretty good, but we can always use more support. So we encourage you and welcome you to join if you feel like that would be useful to you. Um, I wanted to share a little bit about what I sent out in advance um, by email last night. If you didn't look at this, didn't see it, don't worry. There's no quiz. You don't need to have it with you today. Um, it's for really for you to kind of reference. Um, you may want to go back and look at it. I'm going to reference some principles and practices as we go through the session today, so I wanted you to kind of know where they're coming from. And as you can see, there are some categories that are included in this. This Principles for Good Governance and Ethical Practice comes out of um, an organization called Independent Sector. They're a national organization that looks at recommended practices for nonprofits and many of the state associations, including HANO, does what we call co-branding, meaning we say, yep, these are good things. We want our nonprofits to be able to have access to them and know them. So you'll see there are categories around legal compliance, governance, financial oversight, responsible fundraising. These are things that we would want to know about as board members and staff of nonprofits. And I sent it to you. I sent you a PDF. But if anybody else is interested, it's on our website. It's free. Anybody can download it. Um, and it's packed with really good information. Um, but of course, like I said, it's kind of probably something that you might want to go back and look at um, when you realize, oh, we're talking about, you know, whistleblower policy. Let me go look up that information and it'll give you some more, some more good, good stuff in there. Um, for the session today, you know, the first one was a little easier in the sense that it was very specifically focused on board recruitment. This one is a wider, right, kind of this is going to be an overview of all these different recommended practices. There are probably more slides than we're going to be able to get through, but you're all going to get the slide deck, so you'll have that information. Um, please feel free to ask questions as we go along um, and be comfortable if you need to get up, move, go take a restroom break. I'm not going to give you a formal break because it's a short session, so do what you need to do. Um, but we're going to, in this session, kind of look at the context for nonprofit board governance, and that's really actually pretty important. Um, we're going to look briefly at the life cycle, maybe not as much as in detail as we did in the first session. We're going to talk about Kuliana, like if we're a board or staff member um, of a nonprofit, what are the roles and responsibilities that we have? And then we'll talk a little bit about how to maintain a healthy nonprofit organization. Okay. Um, so starting with the, con the, the context, I'm going to share a little bit about the nonprofit business model, which, as we all know, is a little wacky. Um, it's got some good things and some not so good things. Um, and then talk about what it means sort of to be a board member of a 501c3. We have some folks that I know are with C4s or other C things. And so we'll, we'll definitely um, sort of talk about the difference between the sort of the distinction that we make when we say we're a C3. There's an important sort of thing we can do that others cannot. We'll talk a little bit about governing documents, and we'll talk a little bit, as I said, about life stages and good government, good governance, sorry, good government is good too, um, but good governance at those different stages. Um, the business model, when we hear nonprofit, um, we tend to think, oh, that means we can't make a profit, right? But that's not a tax, it's, it's a tax designation, it's not a revenue model. So meaning as 501c3s, as 501c4s, as c whatevers, we are actually able to make a profit. It's just that where that money goes is a little bit different than maybe where it would go for a for-profit. So in order to deliver on our missions, if you think about it, we really do need to actually have more revenue than expenses to be able to, and to be paid for the full costs of doing the quality work that we do. 
But unlike for-profits, we don't have shareholders. We're not paying individuals and saying, oh, it was a great year. The stock market was up, so your dividends are going to be X. We're taking that money and we're reinvesting it in the mission of the organization, right? Um, <clears throat> so I would say to you that I think there are two really critical things that healthy nonprofits need. And we talked a lot about the first one this morning, right, which is healthy nonprofits need a strong heart. Right? They need to have a commitment to the mission, the visions, core values that really drive the work that you do. I see some folks chuckling. I don't know if this is a good thing or a bad thing. <laughs> okay, thumbs up. And a strong core. Right, This is the part that many of us are still working on, whether it's us personally or our organizations. I know I'm working on this one. Um, which means to me really having a sound kind of infrastructure. Right, In order to have long-term financial health and sustainability. We need to shore up those systems inside the organization. We need to have a lot of other things which I'm going to talk about in a moment. So we need the heart. We usually have that, no problem. But the strong core is what we're often all trying to kind of continue to build. If we have both those things, then we can be flexible and adaptable and we can meet community needs more effectively. Right. Um, Hano has spent some time thinking about this. We have been doing something called a decent work kind of, you know, initiative where we went around the state pre COVID and we talked to nonprofits in all different kinds of places about what it meant to um, sort of talk about decent work in the nonprofit sector. And that isn't this presentation. We could talk a lot about that, but there's information on our website if you want to know more. But this is something that came out of that set of conversations was really these two things, right? We need both of these things. Um, so what makes a strong core? We definitely have to have capable and responsible, responsive board governance. And that's where we're going to focus today. We also need to have strong strategic finance and accounting practices. We heard about that in this morning's session, right? That's something really important. I would say that when we talk about decent work, this is really important, progressive, equitable human resources practices, right? Because we cannot keep good folks involved um, in our organizations or attract new talent if we don't um, work on some of these things. And part of the broken part of the nonprofit sector, as we know, is that <clears throat> we often underpay our staff and we overwork them, right? Any, anybody here say, oh my gosh, I'm paid way too much and I don't have anything to do? Raise your hand. Okay, um, right, so that's an area that we have to work on and I think we have to work on it collectively to say we need to be able to pay the folks that work with us so that, for example, if we're serving you know, folks who are houseless as our clients, that our staff are not also houseless because they can't, they're not making a living wage, right? Um, so we need funds to cover our full cost. That's the way that we've been expressing it um, in all of these areas. And this is no simple matter. I'm not trying to oversimplify and say, ah, we'll just do that. It's going to take sy systemic change to get there. But Hano is committed to working on this with all of you. Um, here's where I said I would talk a little bit about the difference between C3s and some of the other C uh, nonprofits. And the reason it's important is that a lot of times when people say nonprofit, they're thinking of a 501c3, a charitable organization. Um, there's a mission that is for some kind of public benefit. And why it's important to be a C3, if you so choose, is that you do receive special privileges that none of the other C kinds of organizations receive. And that is that we can give tax deductions to our donors, which encourages them to give to our organizations. Um, but as a result of that privilege, there's also a restriction, which you see listed there, which is there are some limitations on the advocacy, lobbying, and political campaign activities that a C3 can do. That is not to say that we can't do any of it, and I would encourage you to do it. Absolutely, you can. You just need to know what the parameters are. And I don't think I included much in this presentation about that. But if you are doing any of that work and you want to know how do I know what are the limits, let me know. I'm happy to send you good information about that. Um, 501c4s or c6s, those are other common types of categories of nonprofits. And I know some folks in the room are c4s. Um, so they have a slightly different orientation. Those are 
social welfare or advocacy organizations, they're not eligible to give that tax deduction to their donors, but they have greater latitude. And in fact, because they're organized typically as advocacy organizations, they have way more ability, right? They have a, a much bigger kind of space to play in around advocacy lobbying and those kinds of things. C6s are trade associations. So Kona, you know, Coffee Farmer Association would be an example of a C6. Um, they're there to promote a business or professional, in, uh, you know, interest of a community, et cetera. Again, <clears throat> they cannot give deductions to their donors. Again, they have more latitude. So you see the trade-off, right? We have that ability as C3s to give donors a tax deduction, but we're consequently limited a little bit more in the kinds of sort of lobbying and, and advocacy work we can do. So what does it mean to be tax exempt, right? All of these different categories are tax exempt. It does not mean we're exempt from all taxes. It's a little misleading, right? We need to know that while we're generally not having to pay federal and state income tax, um, we are needing to pay if we have employees, like any other business, employment related taxes, right? Some of us might have activities that are not as related to our missions. We can still do them, we can still make money, but we might be paying general excise tax or unrelated business income tax on those activities. So you would wanna check with whoever is advising you on your finances just to make sure if you have any of those activities, you are paying the appropriate taxes. Okay, um, so to summarize, um, we are as tax exempt charitable organizations there to benefit the public. We're not there to make money for private shareholders. 501c3s have that special privilege to give that tax deduction. Um, but again, with privilege comes responsibility. So as a board member of a C3 or C4 or et cetera, you need to know that you are considered to be the legal entity of the organization, right? Which sounds a little scary at first, but we're gonna break down what that means and it's not that scary. But absolutely, we need to be good stewards, right, on behalf of the organization. And Susie mentioned this in the first session when we were talking about what makes what's a quality of a good board member is this idea of having integrity and knowing we're stewarding the funds that others are giving to us, right, for the, the benefit of a, com a particular community or endeavor. Um, as board members, we want to make sure that we're ensuring that we're, you know, in alignment with the mission that we were established for and the purpose that we got that tax exemption for in the first place. And I would add that we should be helping to support both the strong heart and the strong core of the organization. And you'll see there are two principles referred to there, one that is about stewardship and one that's about legal compliance. And if you're interested, some people really like to, you know, see like where this all comes from. The Hawaii Nonprofit Corporations Act is what governs nonprofits in the state of Hawaii. And you see the revised statute 414D. If you want some good nighttime reading that'll put you to sleep, go check that out. Um, but it does outline sort of in the state of Hawaii, what, is the, what are the responsibilities of a board member? Um, and we'll talk about those things. So I'm gonna give you like the quick and dirty version. But if you wanna look it up, you certainly may. Um, documents that guide your board, right? So as a nonprofit, we have certain kinds of documents that are important for us to know about as board members. Articles of incorporation, which most of you are familiar with, right? Basically, those are the documents that start the, sort of like give birth to the organization. It starts the, the organization out as a corporation, a nonprofit corporation, and basically usually has things like maybe the founders, the purpose of the organization, um, and some other kind of critical key information that starts the organization. The bylaws, and we'll talk more about those in a moment, tend to be a little bit more expansive governing document because they're giving us sort of the rules that we need to know to follow as board members. And we'll talk about what's included there typically. The mission or the purpose, it might not be an actual document, but it's something that we have to understand is core to our organizations and guides us in our decisions as board, board members. And then we have some key policies and I'll talk about the ones that you must have and there may be others that you have in your organization depending on your mission. So all board members should have access to these documents. Be familiar with what's in them. 
In a minute, we'll talk more about what to look for, for example, in the bylaws. That's really important. Um, and there is a principle in practice that says reviewing them every couple of years is a good idea. You don't have to change them every couple of years. But it's important because, as we know, when things change rapidly, something that you set up a while back that made total sense may not make sense now, right? And you can change these documents. You can't change anything that is against the law that is set, but you can make a lot of changes to parts of these documents. Um, and you would want to consult with an attorney who knows nonprofit law before you do that. Um, but you can change them if you need to in order to make them work for you. So that's the idea of why you might want to review them every couple of years. Yes, absolutely, I mean. Mm -hmm. um, the lowest level there. Yeah. Do boards make policies that get lost, they, if they aren't incorporated into the bylaws? Mm, good question. Have, uh, yeah. The board policies, yeah. there these turnovers yeah. happening all the time? I would recommend that, the one thing about, you, you can put sort of snippets of some of the, the policy essence in your bylaws, but what I, don't recommend is putting the entire policy in there because you can much more easily change a policy than your bylaws. And you want that flexibility to do that if you need to. But to your point, I think what I would suggest doing is for those policies that are outside of the bylaws or the articles, I would want them to be in either your hard copy manual, if you still do that, or online wherever you keep your board related documents so that everybody has access to them. Like everybody can get to them when they need to. Yeah. What we did was create attachments, which are part of the bylaws, are referenced in the Ah, bylaws, okay. But they can be changed. And gotcha. Changed. Okay. Perfect. But that's what you want, right? The flexibility to right. do that. And while you can change the bylaws and the articles, as I said, there's usually a more formal process and it says so in the bylaws. It says in order to change the bylaws, you have to have 75% or a majority or whatever of the blah, blah, blah. yeah. So you just want to don't you don't want to limit yourself by packing too much into the bylaws. Yeah. But great. Okay, so there's some different strategies for how you can do that. Other questions I see? We're good? Okay. Um, so I am very nerdy because I like to look at the bylaws. I'm not an attorney, so I always say that up front. I'm not looking at them for the legal stuff. I'm looking at them to understand an organization and the rules they've set for themselves. So I, when I go in and I work with clients for a specific organization, I always look at their governing documents because it tells me a lot about them. So what you want to look for are things like, are there term limits, right? In <clears throat> the first session we were talking about, there's no law in Hawaii that says you have to have term limits, but some organizations do, some don't. If you're joining a board, or if you're on a board trying to recruit other board members, you want to know, are there term limits? How long am I going to be on this board, <laughs> right? Um, whether the organization is a membership organization. Again, some are, some aren't. Why is it important for us to know if we're a membership organization? Anybody have a thought about that? Yes, Gail. Well, I was coached early on by our fellow participant here, Susie Osborne. Mm -hmm. Uh, the pluses and minuses of being a membership organization. Is yeah. Basically, if you're membership, you got to involve them in everything. And there's probably bylaws that say how they get to vote. And yep. they vote. And you, you like bring them in at this management level. So that's when we get models like friends uh, mm. or things that are not quite this membership. Right. Model. Right. So it's a really important word to. Like you're yes. With you don't want to overload your bylaws yeah. and policies. Right. You may not need to be a membership organization. You may not need to be a yeah. membership organization. You can yeah. still embrace. Lots of people follow Susie for that. I don't tell you that often. <laughs> Aw. <laughs> Props to Susie. Um, yeah, I think that's a really good point. Um, some organizations like Hano are membership organizations. And while we are very careful in our governing documents to say not that members get to do everything with us, we have a very discreet thing that we've carved out for them. It is really critical to know if you're a membership organization, what members get to decide and what board members get to decide, right? That's what you gotta know. And how you have to give notice to members and other things. In Hano's case, our members, our membership 
The 501c3 organizations, you can be a member if you're a C4, but the C3s are voting members who vote in our new board members. So that's the role that we've you know, asked them to play. Um, but yeah, you gotta know who makes which decisions, right? And if you do not need to have membership, don't, because it is more complicated. So um, whether the organization indemnifies or protects board members, Susie in the first session asked about DNO insurance. This is where that's gonna show up very soon. Um, we wanna know that as volunteer board members, there are some protections in place for us in that role. Um, and usually it will say so in the governing documents. Typically, the bylaws will say something about that. Um, committee structure, oftentimes it will say either we can make whatever committees we want whenever we want them, or it might say here are the committees that we have. These are the standing or permanent committees, and these are the ad hoc committees we know, or we'll, we'll decide on what we wanna have as ad hoc committees when we need them. And then oftentimes it also shares also the officer duties. So if you're in a leadership role on the board, you're the board chair or board president, what does that mean? The bylaws usually tell you some basics at least about what that means, right? Um, and it will often say for this organization, these are the officer positions that we have. So that's really helpful to take a look at. Again, you know, I don't, I'm not saying you have to memorize what's in here, but it's good to take a look every now and then and just get a sense of that. Um, you know, in the first session, we talked a lot about sort of what the different life stages are of a nonprofit organization. Um, but I know that for this session, we kind of talked about and we're going to particularly focus a little bit more on um, the idea that, you know, many of you might be all volunteer at this point, but might be shifting or moving towards becoming staffed organizations. And so we'll spend a little bit of time talking about that. But knowing that, of course, like human beings, organizations have sort of life stages that they go through from startup to what we ended up talking about earlier, review and renew, which doesn't mean necessarily going away, but thinking again, if something dramatic has changed in the environment, what do we need to assess or review and how might we renew the organization and kind of refresh and make sure it's relevant in the way that it needs to be. Um, but along the way, of course, there are different stages and we again kind of identified that one of the key stages is where we start out maybe as a working board, meaning that the board is in fact doing both the policy setting and the day-to-day -day management and implementation work, right? And so as you see here, kind of good governance looks different depending on where the organization is in its development. Startups, young organizations, all volunteer organizations, Typically are working boards, you're rolling up your sleeves, you're doing all the work, um, you're working you know, both the board and what would be a staff position if you had one. And so we wanna know that that is a, a big time commitment, right? It can be more time intensive, but it's also typically really creative and energetic and exciting because we're shaping and, and really growing this new organization. Um, and we talked about it from the recruitment standpoint. If we're in this stage, we wanna let our board members know, like you're gonna be in here doing some hard work, right? Rolling up your sleeves. Um, you know, as we become more mature organizations, if some organizations stay all volunteer their entire life, and that is totally fine, that works. Um, but some organizations decide as they grow and sort of expand that they want to have staff. They need to have someone in that staff position or several someones. Um, and so as organizations maybe sort of mature and bring staff into the mix. They then, as the board, tend to move into what we call a policy making role, where they're providing strategic direction and oversight to the organization, um, but they're not so much doing the day-to-day -day work of the organization any longer. Um, although we did say in the first session that there might be times when we're inviting board members to come in and do specific projects or work where they're gonna be more hands-on. Um, but again, this is important for us to think about. The commitment is less hands-on um, and less time intensive, but some folks find it boring. You know, they're not as excited. They wanna be on that build it kind of board, right? So just something to think about. Um, and certainly as we move from um, being all volunteer to having staff, there can be some awkward growing pain kind of moments because we're really thinking about sort of this wonderful thing that the founding board members have created and handing it off to someone now who we're entrusting, you know, the day-to-day -day stuff to that we hope 
has that alignment with our values and our mission and is going to carry it forward in good ways while we're still involved and providing oversight. But it is, it's sort of a trust that we have to, to place. And that can be hard when we're just starting it and we're still like really protective of this, this organization. Um, so you just see a little note there that says, you know, if you're feeling some of those growing pains, it's very normal. It happens to all organizations. And the most important thing is maybe to kind of discuss it, bring it out in the open and say, things are shifting, they're changing. Some of our roles may start to look a little different. You know, how, let's discuss that. Let's think about what's gonna work for us. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit later about governance versus management. So I'm not suggesting that we wanna encourage um, board members to micromanage in any way, um, but we'll talk about what I mean by, you know, sort of saying, um, do what is right for you and your organization. Generally speaking, we're gonna have some rules that we'll talk about, but you may have a, an approach that works really well in your organization and, and I encourage you to, to use that. Um, to summarize, to be a good board member, it's helpful to know what's in the governing documents, particularly the bylaws, understand that we have different stages of development and they require different levels of investment and intensity of service from our board members. Um, shifting from all volunteer to paid staff, just a few considerations and then I'm gonna kind of open it up and, and let you share if you have some other thoughts or questions. But as we shift from all volunteer to having paid staff, it's really critical to understand this, which as I, I said was coming up, the board's role will primarily be to govern, and we'll talk more about what that looks like, but providing counsel to the staff, whoever it is that you hire to be on staff. And the board at that point generally is not gonna be involved in the day-to-day -day stuff, um, not on a regular basis. Staff, when they're in place, primarily manages, right? They're management. They're helping the board to decide what's important to kind of surface, address, et cetera. They're providing information that shapes the board's discussion but it's two different kinds of kuleana, right? And we'll talk more about each of those. Um, the board is also, you know, when we think about bringing the first staff member in, responsible for selecting that staff person, but also evaluating and supporting that staff person, which are things we sometimes forget about when we bring staff in. So the board is gonna establish the compensation and conditions of employment at the front end, right? Um, there are some processes involved in that. There are some laws that say we have to understand what's reasonable compensation by kind of checking around and seeing what do people pay executive directors in Hawaii and their nonprofits. And um, most of us do not overpay our EDs, but, you know, um, the IRS wants to make sure we're not doing that. Um, the board hires and fires the executive director, but the executive director is responsible for hiring and firing all other staff, right? So we got to be clear on that, Amadeo. There's a question as yeah. far as uh, you said that there's um, a way of evaluating what the going rate is. For yes, people. yes. Is that available? So there are different places. Um, there's something that used to be called guidestar.org where all the 990s or the information returns of every nonprofit were posted and they've rebranded, they're called Candid now. Um, and they have a super expensive, like it used to be that you could easily go on there and search. And I think you may still be able to do some level of searching for free, but now they charge you money to do some of the kinds of searches. But Hano has a compensation report that we just did in partnership with the Alaska State Association because we had some things in common that we were trying to find out. So we have that and it's available. Um, there is a fee for it, but, um, we might be able to broker a deal if you guys want, if the Puna Strong folks want that. We could probably get you a discount on that. Um, and then, I mean, you the other way you can do it for free, so I always like to share the free things too. Um, you can certainly go and, and um, sort of look at or talk to organizations that are like yours in other places. It won't tell you so much what Hawaii going rates are, but sometimes those folks are more willing to tell you what their pay scales are than your competitors, if you will. Um, the Hawaii Employers Council has a, a compensation study they do too, but it's not specific to nonprofits. So you gotta kinda sift out some of that. 
Um, so ours is the one that is most specific to nonprofits, but I will tell you, um, we're continuing to encourage more participation. If you participate and you're a HANA member, you get it for free. And so tell all your friends because we want to get more robust data, right? It's a little challenging when we don't have as many people participate. So we got pretty decent data, but it could be better. And so we are hoping that the next time we do it, we'll get even more participation. And we try to encourage that by saying, you can get it for free if you participate. Um, if you're not a member and you participate, you can get it at a discount. You can still get it, but yeah. Um, so yes, definitely. There are a number of different ways you can, you can find that out. Good question. Um, certainly, certainly, it's uh, important to know that when you hire this executive director, you want to work with them to understand kind of mutually, what are we agreeing to? Like, what's going to happen in this next year? What is it that's your vision as the executive director? What's our vision as the board? Hopefully we're in alignment. What are our expectations? And being clear with each other so that at the end of the year or whenever we do that annual review that we're supposed to do that nobody wants to do, um, but you should be doing, you should be doing, um, when we're checking in and, and doing that, if we don't really know what our expectations are of each other, we can be very unhappy and disappointed with each other, right? So um, it's important to do that. It's also really important to support the executive director's professional development, right? Executive directors have a lot of things on their plate. They're probably doing 80 different jobs all at one time. And so it's really important as the board to say, okay, We've hired you, we're gonna share expectations and be clear about that. What do you need as the executive director or the key staff person, whatever that title is, to do your job well? What kinds of support do you need? What kinds of training? What kinds of resources? And then the board's job is to help secure those resources. We often think about you know, resources for the programmatic work. Yes, really important. But you wanna have good people and keep good people, you also have to think about this part of it. So. Big responsibility, right? When we're moving to the to 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 pay, but it might also be a huge relief, right? Like, phew, I don't have to do everything as a board member anymore. I got a competent person. Barbara was sharing earlier about a new person who joined their board. It's not a staff person, but this person's amazing, right? So Barbara can take a like a kind of a deep sigh and go, oh, phew, I don't have to do it all myself now. Um, okay. Things like um, some states require when you, they, there's recent really ridiculous stuff that some states have been doing where they want to know for your board, not just the board, and like here we have to disclose names, right, and contact information for our board members when we do our DCCA filing every year. But they were asking questions or they are asking questions about other kinds of affiliations and where they donate to and other things that we're really getting into some not so good territory. But some states, I mean, Hawaii in that sense is a, is a pretty pro supportive nonprofit environment. When we get together with our colleagues who are these state associations in some of the, let's just say red states, um, their, in, their environment is a little different. And they are some, they have some laws that are kind of, um, more stringent and less friendly to nonprofits. So yeah. So like if we get a donor from a whole different state uh, who wants to donate, yeah. there's... You can definitely do that, but where that will show up is in, do you, are you guys familiar with the charitable registration law at all? Does that sound familiar? Okay. So some people know about it, right? It says that if you are making a certain amount of revenue or over, then you're required through, through certain, through donations, certain things are excluded, your grant funds and other things don't count. But if you're making a certain amount of revenue from donations, you need to register in the state of Hawaii with the Department of the Attorney General charitable registration. 
I, it's not in this presentation, but I can share more about that if people want to know. Um, and you have to share certain information and then annually you have to share your 990 and some other information with them. What's important to know about what you asked though, is that there are sort of national or federal laws around charitable donations so that if in fact you end up having donors that come from other states where the laws are a little different, there's some things that you have to do in addition to filing with Hawaii. You might have to file in some other states, but there's a process I think that you can go through where you can sign up and they'll let you know like if you have donors from out of state, what do you do? How do you report that? Yeah. What about for tax deduction? Can we give them tax deductions? For um, I believe that you can, but again, I, I don't think I've ever heard anything different than that. That may not be the legal technical answer, but yeah, that's yeah, okay. yeah. You have the IRS determination. Right. Yeah. So I think you, yeah, you should be able to. Yeah. And the, the amount is twenty five thousand in donation annually here. Yes, here, correct. And it is different in some other you still places. Have to register email to the yes. Well, so what you right and so, sorry, that's not in this presentation, but you're absolutely right. What they suggest is that you should you you can ask for an exemption. If you do not meet that, if you don't think you're going to meet that threshold, you register and then you ask for the exemption. Some organizations do not even have to register, and there are the specific types. I don't have the slide in front of me, but some kinds of educational organizations and others don't even have to register. So most of us should probably be registering. Many of us might be asking for that exemption because we're not meeting that threshold yet. Or maybe we are, and that's awesome if you are, but then you do have to comply. What, what Hano decided to do at the beginning of this to kind of be a good role model was even though we don't meet the threshold, we registered and we didn't ask for an exemption. So we file all the paper, paperwork every year because we're not sure when we might get to that yeah. threshold, right? So we figure we'll model good behavior. And it's not, it's not super fun, but it's not super hard either. Once you've done the initial stuff, then you're just having to remember when to submit that. You know where it is, sorry. It's not on a slide, but it's in your handout on the compliance checklist, when you look under um, fundraising, you'll see more information there. And then I have other things that I can send you that are helpful that have good guidance about that. Yeah. Anything else, Amadeo? Yeah, they recently uh, contacted just about every nonprofit in, mm -hmm. in Bahola Town. Like they just found out about us. Uh, and they wanted they're to- They're on to you now. Yes, man. that's exactly. <laughs> um, but my question is, mm -hmm. uh, regarding the executive uh, directors yeah. Ability to hire and fire staff. Yes. Um, does that include subcontractors and outside entities? Um, oftentimes, what will be, what what will either in your bylaws or in a policy, it will say how you do the subcontracting. Like some bylaws will say, you know, the the executive director is authorized to X Y Z. Again, hiring staff is one thing. Hiring contractors might be another. Some um, boards say, you know, the board the board has to review and sign off on as well as the. So you're right. It may it differs from organization to organization. Yeah. And again, if you're hiring contractors to do work that is like super pricey kind of things, I think it would make sense to have some um, review process in place, right? Not because you don't trust the executive director, but that person may also want several eyes on that kind of process. Yeah. And a bidding process. And a bidding pro exactly. And we'll, we'll get to that in just a minute when we start to talk about potential conflict of interest. Those are good practices to have in place no matter what, so that we're making sure that in fact we're doing our due diligence and we're getting several different you know, quotes and we understand which one is gonna be in the best interest of our organization. Okay. Um, since we're moving in that direction, let's just go there. Um, I wanted to share a little bit about, as I said, the nonprofit um, and staff uh, and board roles and responsibilities and kind of two parts to that kind of understanding as a board member, you need to know what the responsibilities are, but also we need to know how to manage risk, right? And again, this is an overview session, so I'm not digging deeply into any of these, but if you want more info, I can share that with you. I'm going to do the, the overview version. Um, I said I kind of alluded to this earlier, and I said it in the first session, but 
here's the slide that talks about that. You know, as a board, we have two different roles. We're wearing two different hats. It's important to know when we're wearing which of these hats. Governance, where we're acting as a whole group of people together making decisions. Usually it's around stewardship type of things, right? Legal and compliance related issues. And in this role, the board is the lead, right? The board is the lead. When we have staff, we also act as management support, meaning we are supporting management. We are not micromanaging the executive director, but we're acting as individual volunteers. We may come to events, we may work on special projects, et cetera. We are certainly as board members providing expertise, access to resources. We're being ambassadors on behalf of the organization, right? And advocates a lot of the time, frankly, too. In this role, the board follows, meaning you have somebody in place as the executive director. You don't just decide that you're going to go do X. You say, oh, you're inviting me to do that. I'd be happy to do that, right? Or what would you like me to do? How can I help, right? Um, oftentimes what I hear is from executive directors, we have wonderful board members. They're super enthusiastic but they're kind of up in my biz. <laughs> like, I don't want them there, please. Like, help me with that. Um, just meaning that, you know, generally speaking, the staff does have a plan and they know what they're doing if you've got good staff in place. So you want to check in as board members. If you want to be more involved, just say, how can I help? What can I do to help? Don't just assume that your idea is something that, <laughs> that they want to do. Um, okay. Three key areas of responsibility. There's a really nice handout that I'm showing you on the left side that I'll send you after the presentation. It's from BoardSource. They are an amazing resource for boards. Um, go to their website. A lot of things are free. Some things you have to pay for or be a member, um, but they have a lot of free materials. And what I like about this one handout is it kind of covers two things in one, the key areas of responsibility and the standards of conduct. And you can't see it because it's too small, but we're gonna, I'm gonna show you both. Um, but I like to kind of make the umbrellas of responsibility different colors so we know they're different things. But establishing the organization's identity or maintaining that over time, that's a key area of responsibility of our boards. Providing oversight, which we've already talked about, and ensuring resources. And we'll talk more about what I mean by that. Um, I'm going to kind of remind us which hat we're wearing when we're thinking about these roles. In the governance role, establishing the organization's identity, as we said, you might be building it. So you're like, if you're Becky, right, you're actually creating the mission and the vision for the organization. If you're joining the board of an existing organization, then you're upholding that. You got to know what it is and, and know how to kind of carry that forward, right? You should be engaging in some kind of strategic decision making and policy decisions, setting policy, um, and also thinking about where are we headed as an organization. Strategically, what's going on around us? What do we want to do to translate that mission and the vision that we have into a plan? Like, what are we going to do in this next year? And you'll see there's a principle and practice that's referenced there as well. Still in that governance role where the board is leading, we're providing oversight. So again, stewardship, we've talked about that. But there's a number of ways that we might be looking at that as board members. We're wanting to make sure if there are plans in place, we're kind of checking in. How's the organization doing against those plans? You know, It doesn't mean that if we're not achieving it in the way we thought, it's a bad thing, but we need to observe. Like, oh, okay, something's different than the way we thought it was going to be. I wonder what's going on. Um, certainly on the evaluation side, we want to understand, okay, so we set out to have a certain kind of impact. We're supporting this community. We're working with this community. Are we having that impact? Is it working the way that we thought it would? Or, wow, we had even way more impact than we thought we would. Or, huh, not so much. Something's going on. Let's talk about that. And then absolutely financial management, right? So exercising good care. Susie was saying that earlier making sure that we are um, you know, acting in, in ethical and, and responsible ways with integrity, given that we're stewarding funds that others have donated or you know, foundations have granted to us, et cetera. So there's a principle and practice that is about sort of the financial controls and accurate record keeping. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. 
Um, just to say a little bit more about that, just a reminder that the board is the legal entity, bless you. And that means that individual board members need to meet certain standards of conduct, and we'll talk about what those are. Um, in the way in which the world works, there are not decreasing standards of accountability. There are increasing, right? So um, a number of years ago, when we filled out the 990 forms, the information return that nonprofits you know, fill out, they didn't used to ask us all the governance questions that they do now, but then they realized, ah, that would be really good to know, like how are they governing these organizations? So they started to add a lot more questions into the 990 that ask about things like, does the board review the, the audit or the financial whatever that you do, you know, is the board involved in that? Are board members related to each other? They started to ask a lot of things that are governance related questions. Of course, I mentioned the, the Nonprofit Corporations Act, um, which is helpful in defining what Hawaii board members need to know. And then Sarbanes-Oxley, I don't know, anybody heard of that? Anybody remember that one? Sarbanes-Oxley Act? So yeah, uh, yes, exactly, that's where the whistleblower policy comes in. So this was a number of years ago when Enron, remember that name, any of it? yeah. Um, where they kind of screwed up and their board members were asleep at the wheel and really bad things happened and there were some whistleblowers and it was a big mess, right? So they created the Sarbanes-Oxley Act primarily based on bad behavior by the for-profit sector, but it has some provisions in it that apply to all corporations, nonprofit or for-profit. So as nonprofits, we need to know, it says we have to have two policies. If nothing else, you must have these, a whistleblower policy and a document retention and destruction policy. So you'll see there are some principles and practices referring to those two. But in a nutshell, right, whistleblower policy says, here's the process by which if somebody has a concern, something doesn't seem right, they can raise that concern, and we're not going to fire them or, you know, push them off the board because they're raising the red flag. Um, and, you know, we need to know what that process is to protect folks because we want to encourage a culture of transparency and ethical integrity. Um, the document retention destruction policy is really a, a very practical one in one sense, which says we need to know how long we need to keep things, right? Whether they're in a storage unit, in someone's garage, whatever, how long do we have to keep certain documents? Are they, are they literally in someone's garage? Are they on the cloud? Wherever they are, right? Um, as well, I see giggling, right? <laughs> We all know about this, um, as well as as well as things like some are permanent record minutes of your board meetings, permanent record, whether it's digital or a physical piece of paper, you must keep them forever. Wow. <laughs> and there's a reason why, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, but the 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 document retention policy tells you kind of how long you should keep typical kinds of documents. Um, the destruction part of it is also related to what happened with Enron, it says we can't shred documents or delete files when there's an investigation. So we don't just go, oh, here's the evidence, bye, right, <laughs> shred it. So it's meant to, again, put into place some policies that help us to know how to behave so that we can be good stewards of these resources. Um, so those are the two policies, and there's a lot more about those policies in the principles and practices document kind of shares the why and some key things that you want to make sure you include. Is there a minimum recommendation for the retention? Like three or five years or seven years? You know, in the, in the um, Hawaii Co Nonprofit Corporations Act, it has kind of a basic list of the key things that and how long it, you should keep them for. So, yes, but it depends on the kind of document they are. Um, and some folks have like federal contracts, and other kinds of things that might have very specific. So in your policy, what you wanna do is take the basics and then add in the kinds of things that you have and how long you're supposed to keep them for. I don't know if charter schools, for example, have some things that might be different than others and, and you would know how long you have to keep those documents, so, yeah. And if, um, through no, no fault of current uh, board members, some yeah. of that material is no longer, like minutes from yeah. 2000, which have dissolved into <laughs> well, right. I think you have a good excuse. <laughs> I think you could make a good case for why that happened. Yeah. 
I mean, what are they going to do? I, I mean, no, I, honestly, for the most part, I don't know of anyone who's policing that. Um, wh where it becomes important, for example, is if a decision that the board made during that time is questioned. They would want to go back and look at the minutes. Who voted for that? Who said yes? Who said no? If they got, you know, dissolved by lava, what are you going to do? I mean, you can only do the best you can do through no fault of your own. But where we have control, we are supposed to try to keep those documents intact. Yeah. Um, what else should be considered? This is not mandated by Sarbanes-Oxley, but at the federal level, the IRS does want you to have this, and many of the funders in our community want you to have this. Um, it's a good thing to have, a conflict of interest policy, right? Because again, if we're being good stewards of the resources, we have to be acting in the best interest of the organization, not our personal selves. And this helps us to understand that, but also clearly outlines the process for how we handle conflicts of interest, which will naturally come up, especially in a place like Hawaii, where many of us know each other, might be related to each other, might be on the board together, and that's okay. We just need to have some processes for handling those things. But again, the idea is to encourage board members to speak up when something doesn't seem right. Um, so having a policy is helpful. And you'll see there's a, a principle uh, and practice around that as well. And we're going to talk more about that. Because now the super sexy fun standards of conduct <laughs> are um, what I wanted to share a little bit about with you. So there are three standards of conduct um, that as board members we need to be aware of. The duty of care, the duty of loyalty, and the duty of obedience. And you'll just see there in a nutshell what these mean. So duty of care, care for the organization. Be responsible, be wise in your decision making for the organization. And you'll notice it says, as compared to someone like them or someone like you in a similar situation. So if you have CPAs, attorneys, um, insurance professionals, some other expert people on your boards, they may be um, a little more risk averse because what the standard says is, we're not telling you whether it was a right or wrong decision. We're gonna look at someone like you who has the same knowledge you do and we're going to say, what kind of decision would they make in a similar situation? Was yours a reasonable decision, right? So the CPAs might go, well, I know a lot more about that. I'm not going to do that. Not, nope, that doesn't sound like a good idea to me. Um, I'm going to be held to a different standard, right? So that's just, you know, important to be aware of if you kind of feel like, oh, wow, why are they always saying no, <laughs> right? That's why. Um, the duty of loyalty is sort of, you know, the whole idea behind conflict of interest will show up again here. This idea that we should not gain financially in an inappropriate way from our connection to the organization. So again, that goes back to the fundamental reason that, you know, we have the privilege to give donors that tax deduction. We have the responsibility of making sure that we're not kind of giving money to ourselves as individuals other than paid staff, right? We're not giving money to each of the board members just saying, hey, here's some money. We got some money. Use this money. Um, we want to make sure that we're using it in service of the mission. Um, and we'll talk more about conflict of interest in a moment. Um, the last one, duty of obedience, it always reminds me of like doggy obedience school. But what it really does kind of mean is guard the mission, right? Maybe if we want to keep the dog analogy going. Guard the mission, use it as a screen to check in on big decisions that we're making as a board and really to say, are these consistent with our mission? And it also means not just, you know, sort of looking at um, our mission, but looking at the laws, the county, the state, the federal laws, are we in compliance with those and our own governing documents, right? We might be really good with all the other stuff because we talk a lot about what we must do but then we don't do something that's in our bylaws and someone goes, wait a second, wait a second. It says right here, we're supposed to be doing that. Oh yeah, yeah, we, we need to know about that. That's important. So I know that's very rapid kind of moving through those, but we, um, we can talk more about them if you have questions. Um, I wanna sort of share again about managing risk. This is not like the be all end all about how you manage risk in a nonprofit, but of course, the best way to manage risk is prevent bad things from happening, right? That's where we all want to be, like, initially. Um, so how do we do that? We have policies and procedures, like we talked about, but not just have them on the shelf. And Eileen was saying, like, 
how do we make sure that everybody has them, right? Let's make sure everybody has them, is aware of them, knows where they are, knows how to access them. Being prudent board members, right? That's those standards that we just talked about. How, you know, when, when we said things like duty of care, what does that mean in practical terms? Show up to the meetings. Look at the materials before you make decisions, right? And remembering that in the minutes, if you don't agree with something, for example, get it on the record, right? Right? Um, but of course, you know, before that, ask questions to clarify so that you don't just say, no, no, I don't agree, right? I don't understand. Why are we doing this? Tell me a little bit more, right? Um, but remember, permanent record, so that decision is recorded somewhere. Um, and then, of course, the governing documents. You want to be familiar with those. Managing money, I know this is a very little small par paragraph to talk about managing money, but what's most important and that we often find becomes confusing for board members who are not familiar with the wacky world of nonprofit accounting is that we have two kinds of money. We have unrestricted and restricted money, right? We can't just use all the money for whatever we want. Unrestricted funds, awesome. We can do whatever we want to do with that money in service to the mission. Restricted money, also awesome, because typically we get it from a funder or a foundation. It might be a larger amount of money. It's investment in a program, something we're doing. Now we, we also have operating grants, so it might be helping us build the core, right, the strong core of our organization. But there is a restriction. We, it says, here's what this money is for, and we're going to expect you to report back that you use the money for that purpose, right? So in our accounting practices, we have to make sure that we have systems can be an Excel spreadsheet, whatever version you got, could be QuickBooks, whatever, but that we know how we spent that money so we can report back to whoever gave us that money that's restricted, that we spent it in the way that we said we would. And we want to make sure, to your point, that there are internal controls and checks and balances, right, so that we're not encouraging anybody who might be so inclined to commit fraud and <coughs> steal money from the organization and other things. So. What do we put into place that helps us know that there are more than one set of eyes on some of these things? And when you talk with CPAs or bookkeepers or folks who are advising you, they'll typically say something like, well, for example, the person who opens the mail should not be the same person that's reconciling the checking account statement, right? Because somebody could get the mail, altered stuff, and then go, oh, yeah, it all checks off, right? So even in a small organization or an all-volunteer organization, splitting those responsibilities is really key, right? That gives you some of the controls that you want to have in place. Yeah. You may. I think it's not enough just to have a policy in place. Yeah. We put something in place for a checklist that is reviewed and signed off annually by staff and board. Excellent. They understand, they've reviewed and understand the policies because you've got all these fiscal policies, you know, 30 pages or right. whatever, all these other policies. You can't be expected. And it just takes, you know, a really good hearted secretary that trusts everybody. And yep. You've got your separation duties, but that mail for that, because oh, Andy, I'll take care of the mail, and next thing you know, that's yep. what happens. Yep. So, oh. This is like really super important. Yep. Yeah. And again, I'm giving you the, the, the fast, the quick course in it, but you're right, like there are trainings that we do that are just about how to do this and make sure, and exactly what you said, particularly on things like conflict of interest and some of these other kinds of things, you want to like an annual disclosure form, which like you said, people sign and say, I acknowledge, I've seen the policies, I understand them, I know what I'm supposed to do, right? It just reminds people regularly that they're there and that we need to be aware of them. Eileen? I might be jumping the gun, but mm. um, you haven't mentioned um, a nepotism policy. Ah, <laughs> I did not mention that, um, and I'm not going to mention it necessarily, but what I, what I should have said is, those are the core policies you have to have you will have other policies. Nepotism policy is a good policy to have. And maybe share, Eileen, like, do you guys have one? And yeah. Okay. And so share what that's for. Tell us, tell us what that's for. Well, to make sure that um, relatives of the board and uh, the staff are not benefiting right. from the organization financially or being put in 
positions because they're relatives and not because they're the most competent person for that position. Right. And this right. is a difficult thing in this small community. It is. And, and But it is a requirement in your bylaws for getting most of the money that, that folks here are going to Right. A lot of that comes up in a conflict of interest policy too, but a lot of people have both, right? Just to be very clear that we're not just hiring so-and-so because it's somebody's uncle, right? Like we have to have qualified have people. We, yes, absolutely. Probably Yes. And in fact, yeah. the County of Hawaii has a policy for any of the grants that they uh, make available that says that specifically Excellent. they're not related to anybody okay. in county. Or if you are, you have to Oh, good. Okay, so they provide you with... Gotcha. Okay. Nice. Yeah, so they're modeling for you, like, what they want to see, right? That's helpful. Okay. Um, we can keep talking about this, but I wanted to get to Susie's comment about, you know, okay, so we want to prevent bad things from happening, but we also want to have things in place to make sure that if something bad happens, we have some protection. General liability insurance is insurance that all of us should have as an organization. That's for if somebody, if there's a mistake, there's an accident, somebody inadvertently causes harm, that there's damage to the property, you wanna have insurance for that, right? Directors and officers liability insurance is different. You gotta have that too. That says, oh, we didn't, it wasn't an accident. The board made a decision. We can defend that decision. This is why we made that decision. But somebody else thinks, oh, that was the wrong decision, right? And they want to sue you or they want to, you know, tell you that that was the wrong thing to do. So directors and officers liability insurance says as board members, we're going to put some levels of protection in place for you so that, in fact, you do have the ability to um, have legal representation, for example, if we get sued. Um, because remember, again, board members are legally responsible. Um, and the policy, I don't... I don't think in this um, presentation I have too much more detail about it, but you should know that one size does not fit all in these policies, meaning they want to exclude a lot of the things that are going to be the things that will happen. So talk with your insurance professional and say, that's likely to happen here. What do we need to do to build that in as well, right? It's important. Um, and then the other thing to know about it is DNO is great, but if you do not follow the standards of conduct, or you do something illegal, the insurance doesn't protect you, right? So oftentimes in our bylaws, when we talk about indemnifying board members, it says things like, as long as you followed those standards of conduct, as long as you haven't done something illegal, we will put these protections in place for you. So we just don't want to, you know, I don't want to be irresponsible and say, no worries, you've got insurance, do whatever you want. No, you still have to follow the standards, follow the law, all those things. But it's important for organizations to put that DNO insurance in place. And if you're going to join a board, that'd be one of the first questions I'd ask. Do you have DNO insurance for your board? The other thing about the one size doesn't fit all is you've got to think about should it not just cover current board members, but former board members, right? Because, for example, if something happens and a couple years later someone says, oh, yeah, when that happened, that was bad, that was wrong. Now, those people aren't on the board anymore. They're not current board members, but you would want them to be covered by your DNO policy, right? Okay. So that was just a little bit about DNO. Susie, you have anything you want to add to that? Okay. <laughs> Except that I won't sit on the board unless they have DNO. Yeah. Can you give us an example? Oh, go ahead. Mm -hmm. A lot of people think you're only insured if you are the defendant. You can't go sue somebody and be covered by your DNO insurance. Uh, yes, to correct. Them. It's meant to be to protect you as from being or when you are. Yes. Somebody has harmed our property. Uh, Not a problem, but another <coughs> and uh, the police are saying, well, you can go sue them. Right. Going, Officer, you don't understand. Yeah. You're not going to waste your money on I feel like that's a lot of money to invest yeah, in attorneys. Money, and right? Yeah. You know, wait for them to sue us. Yeah. 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 Wow. Well, sorry to hear that. That's yeah. not good, but yeah, right. But you're right. The insurance, DNO insurance, is to protect you from being sued. Yeah. Can you give us an example yeah. of where DNO insurance would be applicable? Like must have cases that you are nonprofits that you know that have been. Yeah. Um, okay. But <laughs> without naming names, yeah. let me think about this. Um, 
much happened with lots of our oh, HOAs. Yes, yeah, that's a good example. Um, I, I, at the moment, I can't think of any specific, like, like real case examples. But um, for example, so, okay, so let's let's take a, a made up scenario. What if um, what if a board approves a particular contract, and something goes wrong, and they didn't do their due diligence, and somebody makes money off of it in a way they're not supposed to, or something wrong happens, and somebody else outside says, oh, that doesn't seem right at all. And whole oh, board members, you made that decision. You signed off on that contract. Um, so, you know, or somehow it damaged them in some way and they want to sue you over that. Um, I'm just trying, sorry, at the moment I can't, nothing's coming to mind. I'll think about it. Sorry, I'll tell you. Yes. I'm sure it will come to me. <laughs> there. But it, ha I mean, it has happened here in this state. And the other thing to keep in mind about that is that when you have, um, remember we talked about restricted and unrestricted money. If you have restricted money from a funder, you cannot use that to pay for, you know, things like hiring attorneys when you get sued. You have to use unrestricted dollars. So that's another reason why when you start to hear about nonprofits thinking about reserve, right, having a reserve, that's one of the reasons why you might want to reserve, right? Um, I know we're close to our time, and I know we have more slides here to get to. Um, so quick question, is our folks okay with going a little bit over the 12 o'clock end time? Okay. And I'll, again, everybody will have the slides, um, so it's, I feel like it's more important for you to be able to ask the questions. Um, this is just a quick reminder that if we take off the governance hat, the management support role is there, right? And if we have staff in our organizations, we've talked a little bit about this, you know, you might be giving time as an individual, you might be um, asked to offer thought partnership to the executive director, especially if you're the board chair, that's one of the roles. Um, and you are often providing expertise, right? That's why they invited you to be on the board. You're certainly enhancing the reputation of the organization. If somebody knows you and says, oh, Eileen, she's like a stand up person. If she's on that board, you know it's something good going on there, right? And stand for your mission, which again is not a focus of this presentation, but that's like saying advocate, right? You are allowed to, there are limits, but yes, you can advocate as board members. Your voice is more important than the paid staff voice because you're there as volunteers. If you show up and you say, this is something good or this is something bad, they will listen to you because you don't have to be there. You're a volunteer, right? Um, so that's important to know. And of course, ensuring financial resources, really important part of the board's role. Um, <clears throat> this does not say you'll see that you have to go out and personally raise a million dollars. It just says you need to help ensure the resources. And so just quickly about fundraising, again, it's not the be all end all. It's a strategic partnership, either among board members or between board and staff members. There are a lot of different ways that you can be involved in fundraising. Some of them are, you're the person who says, I know so-and-so and I am willing to go and make an ask, right? Great, awesome. But you may not be that person. You might be much more willing to say, yep, I'm definitely gonna be an ambassador on behalf of the organization. I'm gonna tell everybody the great work we're doing. I'm gonna let them know, and then they might donate or choose to contribute or be part of, part of this. Many boards have a board giving program, which is what you see in that first bullet, which is I would suggest that all the board members should make a personal financial commitment annually and as appropriate to their means. I'm not saying how much. Some boards, this is what you'd also want to know if you're joining a board, is there a mandatory amount that I'm supposed to give? I'd want to know that ahead of time. Um, you don't want to be surprised with that kind of information. Um, but this is just basically saying we like to know that as board members, this organization is a priority for you. And yes, you give your time, and yes, you give your talent, but that doesn't pay the bills and turn on the lights and you know do all those things. And if funders are gonna invest in you, they wanna know that you're investing first. Board members have made that initial investment. You know, we talked, I think in some of the information that came in in advance, we were talking about maybe needing, wanting younger board members, right, on some of our boards. So we also have to be mindful. We don't want this to be a barrier from having folks who might be at a different stage in their life, career, whatever, which is why you get to decide how much, you know, 
what's if you say to people give something that's meaningful to you for some people that might be a small amount right now but it's meaningful that's a gift they're giving you right so i would i would not recommend putting an amount but some people do some organizations do works for them um, but again, it's, it's sort of about the idea that we want people to kind of have some skin in the game, right? Um, together, I think it's really valuable for the board and staff or the board members even in conversation to build that compelling case. Yes, we're asking for money. Why are we asking for money? What is it for, right? Can we articulate what we need that money for as we're growing and building? And really, hopefully, ideally, you can start with what's in your comfort zone not moving immediately into, please go ask so-and-so for $10,000, but right, your best friend, right? But, but to kind of start with things like sometimes, you know, for board members that aren't as comfortable with that, we say, you know, it'd be really great. We have a bunch of donors. Could you call them and thank them personally? You know, just say how meaningful it is to you, why you care about the organization. Thank you for giving. There are a lot of different roles that we can play as board members around fund development. Um, but we still have to, as a group, think about are there resources in place to support this organization? And if there's an executive director and if there are other staff members, for example, maybe fund development staff, they're also working on this, but we're not expecting as board members that they're doing all of that. We have to be a part of that conversation and support in the ways that we can. Some organizations um, have very sort of, they stack their board to be a really fundraising kind of board. Some organizations are like, my board is not the fundraising board, right? We have other people who do that and help us do that. Um, but you have to think about kind of what's, what's right for you um, in that regard. I would just tell you, share those expectations up front. Let people know when they're joining your board or if they're on your board and you're changing how you're doing this. What are the goals? What are the strategic goals? What are the fund development goals that we have that support that? And how are we expecting you to participate as board members? Um, just last, sort of last part of this is the relationship between board and staff. It's important to have clarity on our different roles and responsibilities. We've talked about that. Really important that the board president and the executive director have a good relationship, right? Because from there grows all the other good stuff in the organization, role modeling, communication, all of that. Um, and we've talked a, a little bit about board development as well. So dynamic teamwork, that's what we're aiming for. It's good for us, I think, if we all know where the organization is in its life cycle, what good governance looks like so we know it when we see it. We're clearly articulating the roles and responsibilities of each you know, board and staff, and that we understand what each other is doing and why. We're seeing how our work is interrelated and connected. And when we're mutually communicating in a regular, ongoing, respectful kind of way, um, and of course, when there's a strong, positive relationship between the board chair uh, and the executive director. And just last couple of slides, I said I'd talk briefly about kind of how to create and maintain a healthy nonprofit. We already talked a little bit about board self-assessment in the first session, um, and we'll talk about it again briefly and also strategic planning. Board self-assessment, if you didn't hear it the first time around, it's really you as the board assessing your own progress, thinking about the health of the board, focusing on your work, your structure, what are some things that are priorities for the board to do in the next couple of years, not the organization? How do we want to improve our practices as a board? Recommend do it every couple of years. Strategic planning is then looking beyond the board at the whole organization some people don't like strategic planning. Some people don't like the word. Some people have had traumatic experiences. Call it whatever you want, planning for the future. Let's call it that. But when you do this well, you're creating a roadmap, right? You have a roadmap that helps you to understand what are the most critical things for us to do in the next three to five years, for example. It's shared conversation between board members and between board and staff, if you have both, about Remember what those organizational values are. How do we behave relative to those values? It's great to have a word like integrity up on the wall, but if we don't know how to act with integrity, then it doesn't matter that we put it up on the wall, right? So how are we using those, those core values and our mission to do that work and create change in the community with the community? And then if you're gonna do fundraising, it's really helpful to have 
that kind of roadmap so that you know when you're out there representing the organization, what is it that we're raising money for? Ah, here's where we're headed. This is what we're going to do. This is what's most strategic. Please help us. And we're done. <laughs> Woo! So if you have time and you want to stay, you can ask any questions. I'm here. Um, and if there are any additional resources other than the ones I already mentioned that you want, let us know so I can make sure to send those and follow up with those. Yeah. Have you ever seen um, multiple nonprofits partner up and how did it go? Like collaborative efforts? Yeah. Um, I Actually, we saw that a lot in COVID, right? And kind of unusual partnering too sometimes. Um, it was really interesting, like one example, excuse me, one example that we highlighted with um, a couple years ago when we did our first virtual HanoCon at the beginning of the pandemic was an organization called Healthy Mothers, Healthy Babies, which looks out for you know, new moms and, and babies, right? Uh, well, Deb Seisman is with Hawaii Children's Action Network, but probably they also do some work with Healthy Mothers, Healthy Babies. Um, but they were, you know, so that was their thing that they did. And all of a sudden they realized that, you know, now we have a pandemic and these new moms are not able to as easily get out and get food, stand in the lines, whatever. So they figured out how to partner up with some of the food banks and some of the farmers and some of the corporate folks that were, and they got a whole kind of, you know, system together to help support the moms and the babies. But it involved collaboration with other organizations that also had similar, you know, purposes, um, but did it in a very different kind of way. So I've seen a lot of really successful collaboration. Um, the thing about collaboration though, right, that we always have to kind of think about is it's not, easy. It's not simple, right? Because we each might have different values and behaviors and the way we think about things might look different. So as we're thinking about potential collaborative partners, we want to kind of look for that alignment and see that in fact, if we work together, even if we have different perspectives at the core, like we'll fit together, right? Otherwise it becomes really hard. Do you do contracts, MOAs, MOAs? A lot of times MOA, sometimes contracts, depending on how big the work together is, right? Absolutely, MOAs are a really good idea because it's fairly simple to do that, but it also articulates who's going to do what. You're going to do that, we're going to do this, right? So we're clear and we're not wondering, wait a second, nobody's doing that. Who is going to do that, right? Yeah. Yeah. Good question. Other questions? Yeah. So we're right at the uh, right here up in San Diego. Yes. And, um, first part of it's about the easy form. Right? Oh, are you talking about the 1023, like what you file to actually be? Yes. Got it. Right. No, no, you're right. Yes. So yeah. I think so. And there, there's a bit of a, there's an interesting converse, conversation going on at the national level about the easy form, which sort of national council and other folks are sort of discouraging people from using the easy form because it does not require you to do some of the front end thinking that's really important. I mean, you might be doing it anyway, but some organizations don't. And they look at that lower sort of you know, like money threshold and they think, ah, okay, it's like my taxes. I'll just do the easy form. But you really should be doing the kind of thinking ahead of time that the regular 1023 asks you to do. So I would recommend, even if you do the EZ form, like look at the regular form and kind of make sure you, yeah. Um, no question is about the narrative section. Yeah, yeah. How detailed needs to be. Like I've seen guys that are putting in like, it seems like they wrote it in an afternoon. And yeah. It. And I'm looking at other ones, it looks like it was written by a lawyer that got made. Yeah, and yeah. And Susie, Susie has a thought about that. Go for it, Susie. It's, I, I went to, I found this because I was helping another entity other than yours, and there was some website on like, how do you get 100% of the potential for you get your approved? So one of the things it said is that there's not enough room on the form itself. You should have three to four pages, and you got to answer the what, where, how, what, who. Yeah. It's, it's all just outlined. I mean, I'll send you the thing, yeah. and it's got all these tips and stuff on it to ensure that it's a successful narrative. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, it's, it's so frustrating. Like, right, copy, paste, everything to the chat. Give me narrative. Right, right. 
the, the main thing, and probably what's on Susie's kind of like, um, you know, cheat sheet is, is also um, what you want to avoid are the pitfalls that the IRS is kind of looking for, like where you don't, where you're not clearly articulating the charitable purpose well enough. That tends to be a place where you can put a lot of words in there, but if it doesn't share how this is a charitable um, organization that fits into one of their categories, then they're like, you know, don't like it. So, yeah. Yeah, I was going to ask you because when you really dig into the IRS, right. info, they give you examples of yes. articles of incorporation and they stress right. that if your articles of incorporation aren't on the mark, yeah. you're not going to. Yeah. Okay. So that's another really good point, And it probably is on Susie's checklist too, is that the governing documents, and we talked about them today, right? That's why they're so important. I would invest in having an attorney work with you on those documents, even though it costs some money, because if you get those right, the foundation is strong. If you kind of just borrow them from somewhere, which trust me, many of us do, right? Um, like they're on the internet, you can just grab them. Um, the thing that happens is that sometimes we overly restrict ourselves in a way we didn't intend to. Because there, if, if you work with an attorney who knows nonprofit law, they'll usually take you through a process where they'll say, okay, in this case, you must do X. In this case, you could do Y or Z. Which one works better for you? And then you go, right, talk it through and figure out all of that. But it's important, like you might grab somebody else's and realize that they put that in place. They needed to, but you don't need to. And then you're like, wait a second, why are we doing that? That doesn't make any sense. So it is actually really important to invest in that part of it. You don't have to have an attorney fill out the 1023, but if they do the governing documents, you're in pretty good shape. And does Mono have a list of any length of attorneys who are comfortable with that? Problem? I do. I have just such a list <laughs> and would be happy to share that list. Yes, there's some really awesome folks who do that work, and they work statewide, so, yeah. He's not on my list, but great, good to know. Okay, so Su check, check with Susie. She's got the local contacts. Maybe we can add him to our list. Yes. But I'll send you the list of the other folks too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just in case, it's always good to have choice and kind of talk to several folks and see. And to what Dana's mm -hmm. there, um, you're pursuing a 501c3, mm -hmm. which is kind of critical if you're going to be uh, participating in some of the grants that are available. Yes. County, state, and federal. Right. Um, you really have to be careful you don't put in a wrong word. Uh, they can analyze just one word and say, well, that's, that puts you into a 501 Yeah, which is, which is why some people do say it's good to work with an attorney to do the 1023 in the sense that they tend to know what those little traps are that you might fall into accidentally. Um, what you can do, there's a kind of a, a in-between version, which is you complete the 1023, but you have an attorney review it, right? Just to make sure you haven't, fallen into any of those traps. Exactly. Some people do. I mean, some people are like, I don't want to do any of it. You help me do it. And they might end up with the version that you're talking about where it's got like a lot of words that look like they're written by an attorney. But you can fill it out yourself, but maybe have somebody review it to just make sure. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, your policies and procedures. Yes. Numbering system, where did that come from? Oh, from the, um, the, the material that I sent um, out to everybody last night, it's in the um, Principles for Good Governance and Ethical Practice. So you can look at the numbers from the slide deck, and then it'll reference those in the booklet, and you'll have that as well. Yeah. I have a question. Yes. This is kind of broad, but um, I've been involved with four nonprofits. I'm relatively new to this. Okay. And, uh, out of those, I'd say three of them mm -hmm. had to ask board members to step down. Because, oh, okay. And I'm wondering how common that is because it seems really frustrating. And uh, do you know why they had to ask them to step down? A lot of interpersonal uh, drama. <laughs> drama. <laughs> yeah. Okay. The Got beach, it. For lack of a better word. Sure. Uh, sure. And, you know. Um, Folks, board members that are like overly analyzing what the ED is doing, yeah. picking apart things, that's a 
you know, that's a thing. Yeah. And other folks that are like have control issues and things like that. So I just uh, curious, I hear about like, that. I mean, yeah. you know, is this unique or is it? <sighs> More it's not it's not unique to have those issues um, not everybody asks board members to step down some organizations go for years dealing with all that crap pardon my French and it's really debilitating to the organization right so I think you know in terms of what I would recommend is you know whenever possible um, even if you've been together for a while it's always great to have board training like when you have a new person come on the board it's a great excuse to have board training because the folks that are already on the board probably need it too, but they don't, they'll say, no, no, I've been on the board for a while. I know you know all these things. I don't need board training. Um, so you can just use the excuse of the new person. Oh yeah, we're gonna tra train that person. But that, because that kind of front ends some of that stuff. The other place that it could show up is if you did that board self-assessment, right? And that might be a good practice to kind of put into place to identify and get ahead of some of those things. But it's not uncommon People get on boards for all the wrong reasons all the time. And so that's why the session first thing this morning on recruitment is also, and I'll share all of those materials with you folks. That's why that part is really important to get right as well. Because, um, yeah, some people want to get on the board for prestige or whatever, for whatever reason, their own personal reasons. And they need to understand that that's not why they should join the board. right? Um, and, and to get back to another thing we talked about was, board member commitment form kind of articulates our expectations. And that's another way, even if we've been around for a while, we can say, hey, we're doing a new thing. We're gonna have a board member commitment form. Let's talk about the expectations that we have, including things like, it's not just for you and your personal interests and don't micromanage the staff. And <laughs> we could, and I'm gonna send a sample to all of you, you all. So there are some different ways that you can approach that, but it's not uncommon at all, unfortunately. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Term limits. Yes. Yes. It's only a year. Yeah. We talked about the fact that you don't have to have term limits, but I will tell you that like 85% of my technical assistance calls, at the root of them, it's because they don't have term limits. Well, another thing, they stagger board member yeah. time slots so that. Yes. You know, you don't want everybody good leaving at the same moment. That's you got to stagger the terms. Absolutely. Yes. Um, one of the things in managing boards is we try to operate under the rubber. Yes. Right. right. Nobody reads rubber tools. Right. Because it's dense. Uh, cheat cheat. Yes. I can send you that. Okay. Yes. That's cool. Yeah. Because in, unless your bylaws say you have to follow Robert's rules of orders, which, which if you t took the legal sort of version of that, you should be following them to the T. Frankly, most people are not served well by following them to the T, but there's All right, thank you everybody. Chelsea, did you want to? Thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, if you have any other questions you think of later, you can always email either of us. Um, you have Jennifer's email, and she'll follow up with all those great resources. Yeah, at 1 o'clock. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for flying out. Flying out. Flying out.